And I do want to once again give honor to Pastor Crow and thank him for the opportunity to be here today and uh, to minister here once again. Matthew chapter 11. I'm going to read verses 18 and 19 from Matthew, the 11th chapter. Also want to mention it's great always to be with our friends, brother and sister Davenport. Appreciate them very much. Amen. Matthew chapter 11, verses 18 and 19. <clears throat> For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He hath a devil. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children." Everybody say with me, and they say. And And I want to know today, who are they? Who are they? How many times have we heard and have we even said ourselves, you know, they say, Who are they? I pray the Lord will encourage you today and give you faith and strength as we deliver the word that he has given to us. Let's ask God to touch our hearts. Lord, we thank you for your goodness today. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your blessings. We ask you, Lord, to minister in this house. I pray that your anointing would be upon this vessel. I pray that you would purify my hands, my heart. Lord, that I might speak as a clean instrument to your people. Lord, anoint my mind, anoint my heart, anoint my mouth and my words, and anoint the ears of those who hear, I pray. Help us, Lord, to allow your word to go into our heart, to mix it with faith, Lord Jesus, that we might grow thereby. And we give you praise and thanksgiving and honor in Jesus' name. Everybody said in Jesus' name. Amen. And you can be seated in the name of the Lord. I want you to notice in our text, it's very, very difficult to please people. John came, neither eating nor drinking, and they say he hath a devil. The Son of Man came, eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. It's impossible to please they. So we need to understand who are they. You see, too often our actions and our beliefs are shaped by what they say. According to Merriam-Webster, the phrase, you know what they say, is used to introduce a common saying or a statement that expresses a common belief. For example, keep trying and you'll figure it out. You know what they say, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. It's interesting that this little phrase, you know what they say, ranks in the top 15% of words used in the English language. But have you ever asked yourself before, who are they? What makes them the authority? Why are they the ones who know it all, and if they say it, 
That makes it true, right? Or I should be concerned about what they will or might say about something and modify my behavior accordingly. We see an example of that in Genesis 12, verse 12, when Abraham, concerned about what the Egyptians would say and do, if they knew Sarah was his wife, he decided to lie to save his life. In Genesis 26, Isaac followed his father's example, and he also lied to the king of Gerar, thinking that the king would kill him to take his wife, Rebekah. In Exodus chapter 4 and verse 1 and following, we see that Moses was intimidated by what they will say. God gave him undeniable signs to prove to the people that God had sent him, and still he was worried about what they would say. The mixed multitude of Egyptians that left with Israel but were unconverted began to complain and, and, and uh, murmur when they got weary with the manna and desired flesh to eat, and it resulted in gluttony and then a plague. And later, they complained again about no bread, no water, our soul loathes this light bread, and God sent fiery serpents among them. You see what happens when they begin to talk, when those who really are not in a tune with God and in tune with the Spirit and caring about what the will of God is, when they begin to complain and murmur, bad things happen. And if we are too concerned about what they might say, it's only going to lead to negative and bad things it's not going to produce anything good. Numbers 13 and verse 32, we read of the ten spies who came back from uh, Canaan. There were 12 of them that went. They came back and 10 of them brought up an evil report. And so you can imagine what must have been going on in the camp as uh, Caleb and uh, <coughs> Joshua were saying, yes, we can take the land. God promised it to us. Let's go and take it. But the rest of the crowd was saying, well, you know, they say, talking about the ten spies, they say that there's giants in the land. They say that the cities are walled and, and that we are like grasshoppers in their sight. And so they listened to what they said instead of listening to what God said. Are you getting the picture today? Is the message coming through? Amen. Who are they? First Samuel 8, verse 7. The majority said they wanted a human king, and they rejected God as their king. Samuel took it personally. And this is interesting. God said, listen to what they say. They have not rejected you. They have rejected me. The crowd, the majority, rejected God in favor of a human king. And we all know how that turned out. 1 Samuel 14, verse 33, after Jonathan's victory over the Philistine garrison, Saul listened to the masses. He could not rejoice in the victory over the enemy. He issued judgment and punishment based on what they say. In 1 Samuel 18, verse 8, Saul was angered and jealous over what the people were saying. Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his ten thousands. In 1 Kings 21, verse 13, they, referring to the sons of Belial, who is the devil, brought false witness against 
Naboth. Amen. You see the answer to the question, who are they? They are usually the ones uh, that are negative. They're the ones that are going to be uh, speaking the opposite of the truth. They're the ones that are speaking against God. They're the ones that are saying things like, oh, you'll never build a church here. They are the ones who would say, oh, God doesn't heal anymore. They are the ones that would say, God doesn't and pour out his spirit anymore. They are the ones uh, who are the naysayers, uh, the ones who cannot speak the truth. Uh, Amen. They may be in the majority, but I say it's time we stop listening to they and listen to God himself. Hallelujah. Psalm 22, 6 through 8. The psalmist writes, But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Oh, praise God. Aren't you glad God doesn't listen to what they say? Aren't you glad God is not persuaded by what they say? Hallelujah. Let the Lord deliver him because he delighted in him. And the fact is, the promise of God is, if you trust in me, if you delight in me, I will be there. I will deliver you. I will heal you. I will be on your side. I am the God that healeth thee. Hallelujah. Psalm 41, 7 through 9, once again, David's enemies speak evil of him. And in Psalm 42, 2 through 4, and verse 10, he says, My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God. Have you ever heard that before? Have your enemies ever come before you and said, where is your God now? Look at the trouble you're in. Look at the struggle in your life. Look at the difficulty you're facing. Where is your God? But David said, when I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me. For if I had gone with the multitude, I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept holy day. You see, what it really boils down to is who are you going to hang with? Who are you going to listen to? Who are you going to let influence you? Are you going to let those who do not know God speak things into your life that discourage you and turn you away? Or are you going to go with the other multitude to the house of God and open your heart and your your spirit to the eternal living mighty God who is always true and who cannot lie. Hallelujah. David continued as with a sword in my bones. Mine enemies reproach me while they say daily unto me, where is thy God? Oh, you see, the voices of condemnation and ridicule and persecution. There are so many voices in our world today. So many voices clamoring for our attention. It just depends on who we decide to listen to. Notice David said, mine enemies. Mine enemies. And if they are your enemies... They are also enemies of God and enemies of truth. So the wise man said in Proverbs chapter 1, verses 10 through 15, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood, 
Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. In other words, in modern day English, get away from them as fast as you can. Turn a deaf ear to them and go in the opposite direction because they are not your friends. They are your enemies. And when they speak against the things of God, they are speaking against eternal life. Uh, hallelujah. They are speaking against what you really desire and what you really want. Ezekiel 8, verse 12 the prophet said, Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the chambers of his imagery? For they say, The Lord seeth us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. Ezekiel 9, 9, Then said he unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel in Judah is exceeding great, and the land is full of blood, and the city full of perverseness. For they say, The Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. Who are they? Who are they? They are the common horde. The ones who just follow along with no critical thought or consideration of truth or accuracy. And they are dead wrong. Ezekiel chapter 37. The Lord sent the prophet to a valley. And as the prophet looked over the valley, all he could see was a valley of dry bones. Dry bones. These were not recently dead. These had been dead for a long time. The marrow had disintegrated. The joints had fallen apart. There was nothing holding these bones together anymore. They were not skeletons. They were just bones scattered throughout the valley. And the Lord said to the prophet, Son of man, can these bones live? Now can you imagine if you had been the prophet Ezekiel looking over that valley of dry bones? What would your response have been? <laughs> Son of man, can these bones live? Ezekiel said what any of us would have said. Lord, you know. This is too hard for me. I can't figure this out. But Lord, you know. And so the Lord said to Isaiah, or to Ezekiel, preach to the bones. <laughs> well, what am I supposed to say to a bunch of dead bones? But Ezekiel began to preach to the bones. And the Bible said the bones began to come together. And somebody wrote a song about it one time. The ankle bone connected to the leg bone. The leg bone connected to the knee bone. The knee bone connected to the thigh bone. And they went through the whole skeleton until the skeleton was all together. The bones came together, but they still were not living. 
Ezekiel, can these bones live was the question. And he had to preach to the skeletons after they had come together. And while he was preaching, he watched the sinew begin to form, and he watched the muscles coming on to the bodies, and and then he watched the skin begin to form. Uh, You talk about a resurrection. Uh, That was a miraculous and mighty and wonderful resurrection that he beheld before his very eyes. Uh, Amen. As God put those bodies back together again, uh, and the bones that had been laid scattered in the valley when Ezekiel got there, marched out of the valley as a mighty army. And then God said to Ezekiel in verse 11, these bones are the whole house of Israel because Israel is saying, they are saying, Our bones are dried, and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Oh, hallelujah. Friend, when you get discouraged, when it seems like you're just all dried out and there's nothing left, when it seems like your bones are dried and your hope is lost and you have been cut off, be careful what you say because God has proven, hallelujah, in His Word that He can resurrect dead bones. He can resurrect dry bones. He can put flesh on the bones. He can put hope in the life. He can put joy in your soul. God is not limited by what he is able to do. His power is not diminished. Hallelujah. He is able to do all things. Praise God. You have to understand they will never be satisfied. They will never admit the error of their ideas. They will always criticize. But it does not matter what they say. Because they have no identity. They are just an ambiguous group of people. Amen. That somebody has decided, has come up with something that needs to be listened to. And I'm telling you today, when they begin to talk, you need to just go right back to the Word of God and say, what does God have to say about this? I really don't care what they say. I want to know what says the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus took his disciples to the coast of Caesarea Philippi. Matthew chapter 16. And he asked them a question that was the beginning of of a discussion, an interesting question. He said, who do men say that I am? Who do they say that I am? The disciples began to respond and say, well, some say that you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Others say you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But then Jesus cut to the core, the crux of the issue, when he said, but whom say ye that I am? You see, folks, if we listen to what they say about Jesus, we'll be just as confused as they are. (laughs) They have no idea who Jesus is. 
You talk to people on the street and ask them, who is Jesus Christ? Many of them will never have even heard of him, believe it or not. Others will say, well, uh, I don't really think he ever existed. Others would say, well, he was a good teacher. Others would say he was a, a carpenter. Others would say he was the son of Mary. Others would say he's the second person in a so-called trinity. You would get all kinds of different ideas about who Jesus Jesus is, but they have no idea what they're talking about. The real question is, who do you say Jesus is? And you need a personal encounter with him. You need an old, your own personal revelation and understanding of who he is in order to understand that he is the almighty God, manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached into the Gentiles believed on in this world and received up into glory. You need your own revelation to understand that all the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in Jesus Christ bodily. Hallelujah. <coughs> really doesn't matter what they say about him. Do you know who He is? Matthew 23, verse 3, Jesus warned His disciples not to follow the example of the Pharisees because they say and do not. They make laws and requirements that they themselves do not follow. So what Jesus was really saying is, don't listen to what they say. Am I getting the message across today? Are you understanding? Who are they? They are nobody that you should be concerned about. They are nobody that you should care about. They are nobody that you should listen to. Hallelujah. They are just a distraction. They are just sent to, to try to divert you and get your attention away from the cross. Just keep your eyes focused on Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 24, there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible they shall deceive the very elect before behold I have told you before wherefore if they shall say unto you behold he is in the desert go not forth behold he is in the secret chambers believe it not if they shall say unto you go not forth believe it not those are the words of Jesus Christ Himself. Sometimes they have a louder voice than anybody else. As in Matthew 27, verses 22 and 23, the multitude, the masses, the majority cried out for Jesus' crucifixion. They had the loudest voice. It was mob rule. They were buying into what they say. And they were on the wrong side of history. Acts 24, 14. I, I like this one. Paul plainly and proudly declared after the way which they call heresy. So worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things that are written in the law and in the prophets. It really doesn't matter what they call us. It really doesn't matter what the world thinks about us. It really doesn't matter what the majority thinks. Uh, amen. After the way that they call heresy, I proudly declare, I worship the Lord God, uh, and I believe all things uh, that are written in the Word of God. Uh, from Genesis to Revelation, I believe it all. 
all. I'm not going to pick and choose. I'm not going to take what I like and try to throw away what I don't like. I believe everything that is written in the Word of God. And I really don't care what they say. Who are they? You know, the Word of God has an answer to every situation. And when you get intimidated and confused by what people around you are saying, the best thing for you to do is find your prayer closet, take your Bible in there with you, and begin to ask God for the answers to your questions and let Him direct you in the Word of God to where you can find the answers. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Seek godly counsel. Study the Word. Pray and seek the face of God because they are usually wrong. God is never wrong. Hallelujah. Stand with me today. <coughs> there are all kinds of people today who no longer believe that God saves or that He delivers from sin. I read the other day something I really liked. I was talking about... <coughs> 12-step programs and uh, how the church sometimes utilizes those kinds of things to help people break their addictions. And I suppose there's a certain amount of value in some of that. But the plan of God really is a three-step deliverance program. Three-step deliverance. You see, if you truly repent of your sins, you're going to confess your sins to God. You're going to be sorry for your sins. But you're going to be sorry enough to forsake your sin. You're not going to continue in it because you're going to be sorry enough that you turn away from it and forsake it. That's all part of repentance. And that's exactly why we hear stories of people who accept Jesus Christ, quote-unquote, and they're delivered from their sin because their repentance was complete. But so often when we get convicted, we just cry a few crocodile tears and we never really fully repent. We don't forsake our sin. So that's the first step. And then the Bible said we are to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or the washing away of our sin. Because the plan is, God says, if you repent, I will take your sin and I will put it as far from you as the east is from the west. And that's what happens in the waters of baptism when we are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. When the name of Jesus is called over us and we are completely immersed in water, covered by the blood of Jesus, the sin is washed away. But then the third step, Jesus said, Peter said on the day of Pentecost, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You will speak with other tongues as the Spirit gives you the utterance. You will concede your control to the Lord Jesus Christ and let Him take over your body, including that most unruly member that no man can tame. Hallelujah. And you will arise, the Bible said, to walk in new life. 
Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. Once you go through the three-step deliverance program, you really shouldn't need anything else. They will tell you, oh, that's not good enough. That's not going to take care of it. But the Word of God says if we walk in the Spirit and live in the Spirit, amen, we will not be bound by the things of the flesh.